Nice hind. Oh, it's because he chopped up the feet. From brass. And there it is there. Isn't it funny that it ran out of energy right on the skin? Came through all that bone and meat, and then it was the skin that finally stopped it. Let's have a look there. Good feel. It's heavy. Through the air. Amazing, isn't it? My name is Llewellyn Stephen Notley Cardina, and my dad's name is called Peter, and he likes to take me to the mountains since I'm the oldest. What do I do for a, for a living? I said, I live for a living. What I do for an income is whatever I can without compromising my integrity. can combine the two, the living and the income, and that's good. Oh, watch out, Eli. I've got a sharp knife this side. Okay. Running out of here. I have these patches of the hair missing on my, on my left arm. To bring a whole animal home, hang them up, the children see what they are, and they participate in the skinning and the cutting up, and they love it. Ooh! It's nice. Dad, I like that smell, kind of. First time Wally saw me shoot a deer, and then he came up to the deer and was kicking a bit that was dead. But, you know, he got a bit sad, and he says to me that it died so we can eat it and live, eh, Dad? I said, that's exactly what it's done. He treated it with respect, and that's that's what I want to see him. Hey, Malachi. Oh. That's something I've tried to instill in them is the appreciation for the animal giving its life. I've got four younger brothers and sisters. And my mum's going to have a new baby soon. And we live in Omahu, a little town in the North Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Like if you ask me to describe Llewellyn, you know, physically he's just a little skinny kid. And he's small for his age. Well, you know, he's not a big kid. But he's got a lot of confidence. And he's clever. He thinks about things reasons things out, and then he can be a little scared thing as well over things that, you know, are of no consequence. Slowly. Slowly. But then he'll lead a big string of horses across rough country. Yeah. Stay on, Wally. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. Aurora's the next one down. She's an hour older than Malachi, so she's the second oldest. But she finds pleasure in simple, silly things. And she's very emotional, and she lets her spirit sort of guide how she feels. She's the best on horseback out of all the kids. See your naughty little legs kicking her and making her gallop. Slow her up, that's especially in the She yard. just lets her courage and her confidence with them and her trust in them. And that's, that's a big thing with her, yeah? Daddy taught me. Malachi's about Malachi. There's a lot of bravado there, but when it comes down to it, he's... It's pretty scared when it comes to doing things that are uh, quite tough. But in the other sense, you know, working with me, helping me, he outworks his brother and his sister. He's got the sort of spirit or the sort of personality, you know, where he, a lot of things he needs to learn by experience. The kids always say that Elias is my favourite. It just seems that way because he's, he's quite an affectionate sort of little boy. When he was young and he got sick, and he had to stay in hospital for a week. So Cole had the kids and I stayed in the hospital with him. And uh, he really bonded with me in hospital. And then after we came back, he was, he was daddy's boy. 
and the kids all from then on, you know, Elias is his favourite because Elias gets cuddled all the time. Well, Elias cuddles, yeah. Corbin's about Corbin, yeah. Whenever she's doing something, it's because it's what Corbin wants to do. Yeah. I can't. You can. She'll do something, and she, if she'd thought about it, she'd know fair well the consequences. Oh, oh, no, 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 you're not going It's anymore. like she's surprised at it. Yeah. I was just doing what I wanted to do. One more. She's the girl version of Malachi. At the same time, you know, she's really loving. Loves her mummy and daddy. When she realises she's hurt us, you know, she's always doing things like writing little sorry notes and how much she loves us and that, you know. How do you spell mum? M. M. U. Very good. My mum's name is Colleen, and she's the bestest mum in the world. I mean, Colleen. There's no better mum than her. I have. <laughs> I have. Many people tell me I'm crazy. I have five kids and one on the way. It doesn't bother me that we have, we've got a, quite a few children, and I'd like to have more, so... Yeah. This is my grandfather, Papa Weedle's house. He's my dad's dad, and he grew up in this house. So it's been handed down from generation to generation. They've had seven generations now of the car and the family in this home. So I think it's quite a rich heritage really they have with this car and the name and also this house. It's over 100 years old. We've got the cemetery, which a lot of people think is quite spooky, just a house away from us. And that's where all the car and are buried. Yeah, all of them were relatives, all the Cardinals. We had heaps of them. People from the Māori Battalion and heaps of family, heaps of people lived there. So for a hundred years old. Look at that all dusted over. That's Nanny Patsy, eh? No, she doesn't look like that, eh? Oh, she's a little bit older, yeah. <laughs> Papa Weddle and my dad don't get on anymore, and Papa Weddle wants to sell the house. Come in. Today's kind of special because Mum and Dad are going to buy the house. They're taking my new baby sister Salem with them. I'm going to resign myself to the fact that we could lose our home, but life goes on. We'll get over this. We live quite a quite a blessed life. If we lose it. If not, it'll be even more blessed. But someone else had already bought the house, so mum and dad didn't even get to bid. This is my home. This is my home, this is my community. This is where I decided I was gonna live. Working on options now, such as just living like Gypsy, sell our truck and <laughs> ride around on horses and just live on the side of the roads. Uh, it's, it's not where I'd like to be, but... I've got lots of family, but if I move with my family, we've got to sell all our horses, which is the saddest out of all of it. First Forget our worries for an hour or so. Swim in the river. Take the kids for a ride. quite nasty there. We had, um, on Sunday, we had, I'd say, about 15 people here. Um, the guy who apparently has brought it, um, him and his family came over and they were just, he was swearing at us and, and yeah. 
not that you need 15 people to go and kick a family up. No, maybe it was intimidation tactics, I don't know. Oh, it intimidated me anyway. <laughs> oh, he's a prison warden, the guy who, uh, who came round to my dad sort of done a deal with and got him got him to try and kick us out. I've done things in my past and dealt with people in my past and been quite hard in my past. And I felt like dishing some of that out onto him. But would have brought violence into our home. It's something I don't want my children to have around them. being on the horses you know we've always talked to them about safety you know um, so we never ever worried about safety helmets mum I ditched the others just ran off without them chasing after the rabbit children don't fear things unless you put fear into them oh hello maybe it's mum's horse got it mm. oh, no, just your nose. Wait, wait, wait. Mm. Salvageable? No, not by the look of it. There's nothing to be worried about, Peter. They've all got trespass notices. They can't come onto the property. So we left all the photos and our stuff. Oh, it's just, you, know, you can't replace photos. He's a Frenchman, he's from England, another Arabian, he's an American. I love the house. Me and my brother even buried some of our soldiers there. But camping is fun too. You might think we're going through a lot of hardship, especially with the house burning down and having to live in a cat, you know, a lot of people like to say, you're living in a caravan with six children? You know, they, they think I'm Superwoman or something. Come on, brother. 
I guess someone who's lived in a flash house and had everything given to them, they would find this way too hard to endure. But it could be worse, you know? I, I've got so much, you know, the house is burnt down, we've lost a lot of things, but I've got my children. They're all alive. They're safe, they're happy. <laughs> all we ever wanted for our kids is to be happy, enjoying life and being happy with, with each other. I think a place like this brings it out, really. Living out here too, you know, they just go and do their own things, they go have their adventures. Life's fun, life's, I guess, to them good. But are we, you know, raising them to be disappointed when they're older? Because life's just changing and the world's changing. <laughs> I hope my kids grow up to appreciate this, this life. Yeah, I like it, Abby. The world still allows us to have a life like this. We just worry that we're going to raise our kids and life's going to be not what they expected. <laughs> it's going to, you know, it's going to be full of hardships and, and uh, you know, just not, not this. But Dad found us a shed to live in. It has lots of paddocks so all our horses can stay with us. We thought we might have to move to my Nana Doreen's house. That's my mum's mum. I said to Peter I wasn't keen on coming back to the shed because mum has mum's house got a lot more comforts. But when I came here, it was just, this is home. This is where our family function. We function here. You know, we, and even the kids are like, oh, it's so nice to be home, eh, Mum? <laughs> I'm like, it is, you know, even though we don't have a, we've got to rush up there to the toilet and, and everything. It's just, we function here as a family. We have fun here. We, we're together here. Yeah. We can do without. Children know a lot. <laughs> we think they don't, but they know more than what they put out. You know, just because things are going bad between Pete's family, our children don't need to be affected by them. At the moment, we can't resolve the problem. We've had to withdraw ourselves so that we could protect the kids. I was always taught we, we talk about things and we solve problems. Whereas Peter grew up where your opinion didn't matter. It was mum and dad were right. We'd all fell in love with Peter's mother. And when you fall in love with that person, you fall in love with everything about them, whether it's children she's had for someone else. And they were young children. Peter was probably nine. And how could you not love a little nine-year-old? How could you begrudge them that they had a different father? Me. Salem's the baby. <laughs> Personality's growing all the time. She's the only one as a little baby who really liked me and wanted me. Yeah. And I loved it because it was, yeah, it was in a, in a time in my life when I was having quite a few trials, and when there was this dark cloud over me, there was that little bright thing there. So she, uh, she saved my soul. <sighs> it's funny, yeah, yeah, little, little babe is there when you need it. I don't know how people can say there's not a God. Because someone made it happen that way, you know? I have a trial and 
everything's that happened in my life, and at the same time, there's, there's always a ray of hope or, or, or something that's, that's bright. So, she came at a good time. But they all have, they've all come at good times, they've all come at the right time. My wife came into my life at the right time. I say that I married above myself, and I feel I did. I feel that the rest of my life I have to work at being worthy to have my wife. You want your sister to fall? Um, no. Well, obviously you do. <laughs> my mum's having another baby, and a war in Corbin want it to be a girl. But me and Elias are hoping it's a boy because we get to do all the work down at the yards and help Dad and stuff like that. I'm not so keen, I think. I'm not so keen on this having this child and maybe having more because we're in a situation... Well, look, we live in a shed. Home is my kids, my husband. It's not about a flash building. It's just where you find... where you, you're loved. And so, yeah, I couldn't say I'm homeless, no way. My dad's got all the horses out there. He's going to start a business. I reckon they'll like it there. Yeah, just to live the way I want to live, I have to buy into this whole aspect of, of, of money and earning money and... Yeah. The other option is that I, I could just become a gypsy and live on the road with my horses, but that gives us no security. So, you know, the whole society is based on this idea of land ownership. Our whole society is based, and that is the, that is the truest wealth of owning the actual land. So I've gotten to, this, to the point where I, uh, I'm going to have to earn enough money to buy land and say, that I own the land and now I can stay on it and I can have my horses on my land. It's a conundrum. It's not in very deep, is it? This is where you went wrong, Coco. You should have come in from the top. It's only a baby. Gotcha. So scared. Oh, no, no, no. Better than down the pants. Kids will love you. There's a saying that there's nothing better for the inside of a man than the outside of a horse. And that's based on uh, just the sight of a horse. A beautiful horse is a, is a compelling thing to, to stir the inside of, of one's soul. It goes a bit deeper than that for me. It's the inside of a horse. It's that spirit inside them. It, um, it reflects myself. It reflects the inner person. Working a horse represents the same way I, I can craft myself and form myself. Because it, you're really, you know, you're here on earth to form yourself into something worth being proud of. I can take a horse that's a clean animal and has base instincts and natural instincts, and I can change those instincts to be of service to me, but also to go against what natural instincts it has. Because a horse that lets me hop on its back and ride it and goes off a cliff for me or, or into a river for me or does all these things that I get them to do is actually going against all its natural instinct. If I look at it sometimes, I look at it and I, and I think I'm a slave master. Basically, I am. I get these animals to do what I want, and in return, they get fed well, they get cared for, they get loved. 
and uh, it's a fragile relationship. But you find yourself coming to a relationship with the horse where it gets close to equal. And you love the animal. And you know, I've got a few horses here that I love dearly. This place is called the Ruehe Nest. It belongs to our tribe. Dad keeps most of his horses up in the mountains. He's been breeding them for a long time. Some of them are still wild. To come up hunting and check on them and see the new foals in the spring and to watch them grow. And sometimes I come up here and it's, you know, we might have had a hard winter or some heavy snows or something and you lose some. You might see an old mare that you might find her dead somewhere and it, yeah, it can be a bit sad sometimes. But come up and catch them and handle them and take them out and sell them. Now we've got the business with the horse trekking on the beach. We're going to need most of them. So I'll probably still sell the couple. Here comes some rain. As long as that rain's just drizzling like that and it's not blowing, then it's good for hunting. Keeps the animals calm. You see an animal, a living being, and you're gonna continue your life or, or sustain your life by taking the life of that other living thing. I'm taking everything from this animal. I'm taking its life. It's not a quick, guiltless process. I wanna take all care to kill this animal in one shot. I think there's a responsibility or an onus on me to do that because of what the animal is giving me. This is the difference between hunting to kill something and hunting to sustain yourself. You know, I could spend a day at the freezing works killing cattle and earn enough that day to maybe buy half a side of venison, half a deer. I work hard and I'll be sweating. You know, I might shoot a deer down in, in some gully and got to carry it up. And there'll be times when I'll just be sitting there thinking, I don't know if I can go any further with this thing on my back. On the edge of a clear, the rifle up and the scope was clear. And my neck shot this one. Blew his neck open. Nice little pig. Nice little porker. It's a lot more work, but it, it makes me feel good. It makes me feel healthy. He's healthy. Got a bit, little bit of fat in them. <sighs> have a shower. Hang him up and have a shower. I've got great memories of my childhood when I was young, coming up into the mountains here with my dad. Great memories of me and my wife before we were even courting. We were good friends and we used to come up here and spend long periods up here. We just come up here and bring food and stay till the food ran out, or Colleen might say that she felt like a fizzy drink or a Rush Monroe ice cream. So we pack up and ride out all of a sudden after spending a few weeks in here. Yeah. on the edge of town. We had to change schools again, but our new school is cool. And there's this one. And we learn Māori, English and Spanish. It's really nice to have a home that's spacious. And there's This is the spare room where we can pop in here. That's the time out room. We're going to get a lock on it. But with more room, we tend to want more space. Like the children tend to go to their rooms and play with their things. And we've kind of divided, whereas in our little shed, we were only in one room, we were more content to be with one another. I liked it better. I felt there was more happiness in the smaller home than I do in a bigger one. It's a little bit messy. In my room, you can get out the window and onto the roof and over to Mum's bedroom. No 
know, me and Pete talk together about our parenting all the time and, you know, how we can improve. And often I pray about it, about, about things. Actually, quite often I do. You know, things that bother me or I feel like I'm not doing right, I'll pray about it. As parents, all we teach them is right and wrong, and they learn from the brothers and sisters. Corbin, right up to Clewellyn, all are teaching Salem things. And she makes choices, and she sees things and watches things, and they advise her, and then she starts learning. Because children want to learn. They do. Mm. I knew something was wrong and I had my midwife come over and she just checked me over and said it didn't look good. She says it looks like baby had died and the kids just burst out crying, which was, yeah, mm, really sad. Mm. We just sat there for a while crying. I stayed away from it. I came and had a quick look, and then and since I've stayed away from it, because it gets a it gets a fury up in me. Some fur, unburn. Oh man, that'll teach me for not looking in here when it first burnt down. Just staying away and sulking about it. Oh, we thought we lost all of this. Oh, man, Colleen is going to be so happy. With my firstborn. <laughs> There's me with my son and my mother. Me, it's 16 years old. There was photos of, of my dad, photos of my brothers, photos of all of our family. We'd sit down in that lounge room there with all the children, just with a big box of photos, just pulling photos out, and the kids would look at it, and what was this horse's name? What was this dog's name? Is that dad? Is that mum? Who's that? Is that Uncle Kerry? Is that Papa? Yeah? Spend the whole night doing that, yeah? It was something special we do now and again. My dad put a trespass order against me, apparently. He did it when I was living here. How can you give the tenant a trespass notice? He did it because he was angry. He acts out of anger a lot. To be honest, I don't know why he really, really does hate Pete. His number one goal now is he wants to destroy Peter. To the point he's even telling people of recent that the horse wrecking business is his, that the, all the horses are his, and that Peter owes him big time. And it's like we've, we've totally withdrawn ourselves so that he has nothing to do with us, but he's going out there to, to do it. Cole, come and have a look what I found. Oh, I... Hey, those are all the negatives. This is while he was a baby. Those ones I took out of his album. Oh, brilliant. I walked in the house and I see this photo here sitting on the ground. See, I found pages of this. I don't know, because yeah, I was sulking and didn't go through everything. I didn't pull open boxes like people have been doing. But look at these.
Come on, son. We're missing. Seen any horses yet? Eh? Seen any horses yet? No. Thirty horses disappeared into Finair. I thought he caught that foal. But... I've resolved myself to the fact that um, they're gone. They were stolen. Really? I don't know if there's another name for it. You take someone else's horses, they're stolen. You come in here and take them and away somewhere as your property. That's theft. We'll go have a look. There might be something here. Uh, so I actually said, Dad, how do you sharpen knives? Then he told me nothing that I just keep practicing. I'm almost cutting my finger. Now I've got heaps. <laughs> Just little bits of hair. Oh, now my good hair's gone. 50. Right, Well, he picks up on everything I do, and if I've got to really, really check myself. For a long time, you know, I saw all these good things in him that I that were the good things in me that I liked. And now he's starting to pick up some of the bad things in me that I don't like. It's a paper cut. I know, but it stings. Of course, I'd like him to live by morals that I think are right. But, uh, you know, he may see things a bit different than I see them. So I'm hoping that he... Yeah, fortified in his own conscience that he, he will use it to dictate the decisions he makes in his life. Okay, you don't go. Okay, you see how that's easier to keep quiet when you walk like that? You don't slap it down. It's funny, uh, when I was young, you know, I got in trouble when the old man was a diary keeper. And he'd keep things in a diary. And I remember, like, getting in trouble over something. And he'd pull a diary out and start going through a list of things that I've done wrong, you know? Even now, he'll bring up things I did, you know, 20-odd years ago. You know, when I was a kid, I used to sit there and, and he'd be talking to someone and he'd tell a story about some magnificent shot that he pulled off when he was out deer stalking. And I remember he used to say to me, hey, Peter, you remember that? And I'd be there and I'd be like, I'd be like, no, that was John who said, who did that. You know, it was someone else's story. And then he'd go, Kerbin Ziegum, Zagen, Squats and Holes in Mein Hunts. And he he told us earlier that that was, a, that was a, the sign for if we were saying the wrong thing. But yeah, this, this, this is at home. He pulls us aside and he says, if you hear me say this, that means you need to shut your mouth because you're saying the wrong things and you're going to get it when you get home. Yeah, that was the sign. And so we'd be in a conversation like that, you know, and he'd be talking to someone, and I'd say the wrong thing, like, no, no, John pulled off that shot, or, or Paul, or, or, or Dave, or someone. Yeah. Well, no, Dave did that. Yeah, and this is a 10, 12-year-old kid, and he'd bust out, Kevin Ziggum, Zagen, Squats, and Holes, and Mein Hunts. And people would be like, what the hell? And then he'd just go back to normal, like, telling a story, yeah. And I'd be thinking, oh, shit, I'm in trouble when I get home. I've said the wrong thing. I've done the wrong thing. Yeah. 
I saw that all the time. It's just... Yeah. But at the same time, he could be... as a horse. At the same time, he could be... Um, be quite a neat, sort of interesting person. He's an old son. Be careful. Come down here and sit down. We'll go down around these for her. If she's down there, there might be more. Oh, yeah. Check You can see her without even the binoculars. She's a bay mare. No, a chestnut. Oh, yeah. Should be another 30, 35 horses or something with those ones. And then the foals that I hadn't seen this year. The place is empty. I know, what's the lesson to be learned? Yeah, what is the lesson? To be meek? Is that my lesson? Because I have been up till now. I've had a lot of things done to me and wanted to lash out and haven't done it. Someone burns down my house, threatens my family. Steals my horses. Yeah, I think, I think I've been pretty passive about it. And maybe they, they take advantage of that. Maybe they, they take advantage of my good nature. Or is that the lesson, that maybe I should fight? Maybe, hey, fight for what, what's, what's right and you, you know, stand up for what you believe in. I've done it in a passive way up till now. That's why he's been getting away with it. What is it behind you? Behind me. See, he knows I'm being meek about it. He knows that I could be hard. <laughs> yeah. There's no taking things back. Because your words can't be taken back. And the same with your children. You can't, you can't take back how you treated them. And I think there's a huge price to pay for people who who don't get things right in this life and don't treat their children right or their spouses right or their fellow men right or themselves right. Raising children, if you treat them in fairness. I treat my children how I would like to have been raised now that I have hindsight to look back on it. From the girl for me, for a dollar. Who did you hear? Every Sunday we put on our nice clothes and go to church. Papa Whittle and Nana Patsy go to the same church too. The kids love their grandparents. Chuck your shirt in, son. They haven't been able to love them as much as, and to grow with them as much as they should. One, two, three, four, five, six. You know, there's been times where their nannies walk past them. I saw my, my son Malachi grab her head. And say hello, nanny. <laughs> it's neat. They, they reach out to them. Not my son. 
That's my white side. All right? There's a difference. I have a skateboard. I don't think you're any different than my other children. I never would. That's right. I don't either. But there's something for someone else to learn a lesson. All right? It is very, very distasteful when the sun sets about to assert power. I know that thing is still going. It's a thing from a clown. No, I don't think you're a clown, and he works no. for me, so it's mm. not his responsibility. He's lucky it's he's mine. still standing. No, he's on public land, I and hate he works for Let me. Let me tell you something. It doesn't matter where you stand, where offences or crime are committed. Understand that. Huh? You ever heard of the doctrine or the script, honor thy father and thy mother? Certainly I have. And that's the underpinning principle of which I talk about this. Right. When you understand that and comprehend it, it is worthwhile telling the story. Did you burn it down? Pardon? Did you burn it down? No, I didn't. I have a feeling in my heart we burnt it down. But one day, someone will have to make an account of it. One day. It definitely wasn't me. There's been a lot of people live here. My dad's parents, their parents, and their parents before them. Well, what, did, what did I do? I didn't agree with my dad on some things. Yeah. Didn't have to be that way. Yeah. Our house that burnt down was really special. It was warm, it was loving, and we had lots of fun there. The old adage, you know, we say to our children, would you like it if someone did that to you? Yeah. No. Then do you think it's fair that you do it to them? No. You know, that's always the answer. Yeah. Except with maybe Malachi sometimes. Yes. <laughs> Why is it fair? Yeah. Now, I grew up with this, with this thing on us that we had to, we owed our parents. And my dad still says that, we owe him. We, we owe him some great debt because of how he brought us up and what he did for us. Yeah. And yeah, it's early days yet. You know, my oldest is in his 11th year, but uh, I don't see him owing me anything. If anything, I owe him. I owe all my children. And, and then some.